The Institute for Creation Research is composed of, of individuals that have advanced degrees in science and believe the Bible from the very first verse. If you were here at Sunday School, you remember that we talked about Genesis 1-1, one of the most profound scientific statements that have ever been made. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and again, a cosmologist, somebody who studies the universe, the fabric of the universe, uh, would admit that this universe is composed of time and, spa uh, time and space. What's the third one, class? And matter. Good, good. And so in the beginning, that's time. God created the heavens, that's space, and the earth. Matter. So in the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the book of books, God, who has always existed, spoke into existence this universe, the time, space, matter, universe. Three in one, right? Uni means one, right? Don't pull a wheelie on a unicycle. Thank you. Thank you. And so, yeah, three in one. And so uh, uh, we enjoy science at ICR, and we do science at ICR, empirical science, observable, testable, and repeatable. We have no problem with that whatsoever. This morning, we're going to talk about your origins matter. Look at those initials, Y-O-M. Anybody know what the Hebrew word yom stands for? Day. Very good. Day, And so we believe that God created in six literal 24-hour days. He gave us an astronomical measurement for that day, and we're going to look at that right now. USA is the large, has the largest number of churches and seminaries, Christian colleges, Christian bookstores. We have so much of that here in the United States, and yet, sadly, the United States is becoming less Christian every day. And of course, we see that in society, right? We read the first chapter of the book of Romans. <laughs> it, looks like, it looks like we're reading uh, the, the newspaper headlines here in the United States, Romans chapter 1. And so why is it? Why is America becoming less Christian every day? Well, there's many reasons, but the real issue is God's Word versus man's Word. Too often, many well-meaning Christians uh, are, begin to compromise God's Word, and that means trouble. The loss of biblical authority is the root of decline of Christian America. I mean, you just, just have to see it, and you have to say it. It is the loss of biblical authority. We find that creation is the foundation, God's Word, who is there in the beginning, the 66 books of the Bible, beginning with the creation account in Genesis chapter 1 where God told us ten times that he created after their, help me out, just us here this morning, after their what? After their kind, right. And God told us ten times he created after their kind. And as the foundation, we have laws and marriage standards. Even the meaning of life are all centered on the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis. Man's opinion, on the other hand, is based on the strange idea, the philosophy, evolution. We call evolution a philosophical conviction because there's nothing we know about evolution that's true. Let me repeat that. There is nothing that we know about evolution that's true. Now, when I say evolution this morning, I'm talking about the molecules to man, fish to philosopher, particles to people type of change. We've never seen any of that. And remember, empirical science means what we can observe, observe. At least 70% of empirical science is nothing more than sitting down and observing a process. And so evolutionism is the foundation of man's opinion with lawlessness and pornography, abortion, all of that has its basis, if you will, on this subjectivity of evolutionary naturalism. Hey, man, what's true for you may not be true for me. And so it's all very, very subjective and relative uh, when it comes to man's opinion. And so when creation is destroyed, when God's word is openly maligned, denigrated, or simply not believed, then we, kind, we, we see the edifice crumbling there. And so Psalm 11.3, I think, is very, very apropos for the United States today. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? That is so true this morning, ladies and gentlemen. If the foundation is destroyed, as we're seeing it happening, what can the righteous do? The debate really is, can we take Genesis chapters 1 through 11 literally? Now, we at the ICR say that God's Word is absolutely true. Every jot, every tittle, from Genesis to the maps, 
the Bible is true. And that includes the most, uh, the most contested chapters in the Bible, which are the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. The first 11 chapters out of all the other chapters of the Bible is the most questioned and, as I say, hotly contested. Because in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, we have the creation, Genesis chapter 1. We have the corruption of the creation. That's Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, when Satan said to Eve, did God really say that? Openly question, openly questioning God's authority. So the first two C's are creation, the corruption. Then God cursed the earth, didn't he? He cursed the earth with weeds and thorns and thistles. My field is parasites. I think that's the origin of parasites. I can't prove it. So we have to be careful about what we say. But it looks like that was the origin of parasites. And then, uh, of course, mutations, genetic mistakes as well. So that's God cursing the earth. And then we have the catastrophe in Genesis chapter 6 through Genesis chapter 8 and on into chapter 9. The catastrophe, the Genesis flood that covered this entire planet. Now, folks, Scripture has always taught that, has it, has it not? Shake your head like this. Yeah, a worldwide Genesis flood. And the evolutionist would laugh at us over and over and denigrate God's word and openly question God's word concerning a flood <laughs> until about the last 50 years, maybe 40 years, when secular geologists who have no theological axe to grind began to study more and more the surface of the crust of the earth and realize it looks like the surface of this planet, in fact, everywhere had been covered with styrofoam. No, with with water, right? And so now they are admitting, and I have a whole presentation just on the Genesis flood, 90 minutes. They are now admitting, and I salute them for being intellectually honest, they're now admitting this entire planet was covered with water in the past. Now, of course, they say millions and millions of years ago. I call them Darwin years because they don't really exist. But they are admitting in the last four decades or so that this planet was covered with water. Who has been saying ever since Scripture is written that this planet was covered with water? The Bible, Scripture. Who moved? <laughs> the evolutionary community moved from saying this planet never, never experienced a flood to they're standing right next to us now in agreement that this planet was covered with water in the past. And so we believe the four C's that we just went over. And also, I think it's interesting, in these openly challenged first 11 chapters of Genesis, what did God do? He put Genesis chapter 5 right smack in the middle. Wait a minute, what's Genesis chapter 5 about? Oh, that's right, the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. The genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, Genesis chapter 5, where it begins with the first Adam, right? And it ends with the, as Paul says in Corinthians, the second Adam. And so <laughs> when uh, people want to openly question the first 11 chapters of Genesis, they say all those first 11 chapters are, are poetical or metaphorical, but they are not to be literally believed. Folks, what does that do to Genesis chapter 5? It says that the Lord Jesus came from a metaphor. As I like to say, I'm again it, okay? As we say in Texas, I'm again it. I believe Jesus uh, uh, came from a literal, his, his genealogy is from a literal Adam and Eve. We'll look at that right now. These chapters contain the creation, the corruption, the curse, and the catastrophe. So here it is, Genesis chapter 5, beginning with the first Adam, a real blood and flesh individual. And, and so they existed uh, about 6,000 years ago when God created. And so we read about from Adam to the Lord Jesus Christ there throughout the genealogy. But if people want to question Genesis 1 through 11 and call it poetical or call it metaphorical, then this is what they end up with, a metaphor to Christ. I don't think the Bible teaches that. <laughs> Um, here it is, Jesus Christ, the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, and the first Adam, 1 Corinthians 15. Which Adam is non-essential to the gospel? That's a rhetorical question. And so, yes, we believe a real, as you can see there, flesh and blood Adam to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what God is getting across to us in his word. Fifth chapter of Genesis. So Genesis also is the foundation for the gospel. 
Genesis is the foundation for the gospel. If I have told you earthly things, said the Lord Jesus, and you do not believe, then how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? If you don't believe uh, that God created in six literal 24-hour days, and that in fact, yes, this planet was inundated with water all over the earth for over one year. And, the, and uh, that Genesis flood was about 4,500 years ago. If you don't believe that, how can I, how do you believe if I tell you heavenly things? John chapter 3. So we have God's infallible word here and man's fallible word. And unfortunately, why do people change the infallible one when they want them to agree? That doesn't work that way. God doesn't want us to alter his word. Remember what the Lord Jesus said, it is written, have you not read? As we read about Matthew 4 and Mark chapter 14, etc. So we believe in six literal 24-hour days of creation. We believe that they are six literal days, that we don't try and add enormous time periods uh, between each day or trying to re represent these enormous time periods as in, in each of the six days. We just believe they're literal six 24-hour days. Here's a question this morning. On what day of creation were dinosaurs created? Well, I'll give you a hint. It's up on the screen there. Day six. Very good. Day six. And so I asked that two months ago, and a little boy in the front row said, Thursday. But God created dinosaurs, and we call dinosaurs that I see are missionary lizards. <laughs> we just love dinosaurs. They show the majesty of God. And, of course, now for the past couple of decades, as you heard in Sunday school, we're finding soft dinosaur tissue. That's almost an oxymoron, isn't it? Soft dinosaur tissue? Wow, that's kind of like oxymoron, like uh, airline food or jumbo shrimp, you know. Some of these others. But anyway, yes, they're finding soft dinosaur tissue. How can you have dinosaurs becoming extinct 66 million years ago, and yet they break open these fossilized bones and they find soft tissue? Collagen. What's collagen? Well, I used to teach anatomy and physiology to the pre-med majors, and collagen is a glue. It's an organic biological glue that holds our organs and tissues together. And they're finding this dinosaur collagen. It's a very complex protein, uh, repeating protein subunit molecule. And they're finding soft dinosaur tissue. Well, again, this is very, very exciting. And so, yeah, people were created in day six, too. So we don't find people and dinosaurs buried together because they didn't live together. They are separated by something that we call ecological zonation. And that's, that's a valid scientific theory. But let me, let me move on here. Uh, where do you fit the millions of years? People who say, oh, well, the evolutionists must be right, and this planet is many millions of years old. <clears throat> well, uh, where do you fit them? You know, you've, you've got the genealogy there. You've got the, the timeline. There just doesn't, there, there is no place to fit the millions of years. Where do you fit them when it comes to the six days of creation? Before the beginning? Do you fit them as a gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2? Um, do you stretch the days into ages, as we see here? Instead of day one, it's, it's age, day, uh, age one, age two, or so forth. There just isn't any way of shoehorning all of these uh, artificial Darwin years into the biblical narrative. So day is used 2,000, uh, 2,301 times in the Old Testament. Why only question Genesis? Why not question the rest of the usage of a 24-hour day in the rest of the Old Testament? It just seems that the, the people openly question how long the day were, was, the Hebrew word yom you see up there, when it comes to the days of creation. Well, I don't want to go through all of this here this morning. You can see this diagram. This is a miniature Bible study right here, just this one slide. This will preach a couple of Sundays in Sunday school class as we look at the nature of the uh, word yom, your origins matter, or yom, which is 98% of the time, a 24-hour period of time. 
So let's put three of these definitions of a day in a sentence because, yes, it's not exactly that every day is a 24-hour period. There's a little bit of latitude there. And so let's go ahead and look at this word yom and how Scripture, how we could use it, for example, in the uh, human language. Back in my grandfather's day, it took three days to drive across, well, where else? Texas during the day. So, we, ladies and gentlemen, we have the use of three times we use the word day in different ways, and they're very, very clear, aren't they? Okay, but God is also uh, not the author of confusion, as Paul says in Corinthians, and he makes it very, very clear about how he is using day during the six days of creation. And so I like to use this analogy here, this example of the use of day in our own language. The word yom in the Old Testament almost always is used in this natural way and is never used to mean any other definite time period, period than a literal day. This becomes especially clear when it is combined with a number, for example, the first day, or with definite bounds, for example, evening and morning. So it's very, very clear to understand how God is using this critical word to describe his creation just thousands of years ago. In fact, if you want to say, well, days are very, very fluid, you can use them just any way you want for any time period you want, you're going to run into problems like this, where how many, there's a word, days was Jonah in the belly of the great fish. Lord, it's been 3,000 years. Help. Because, you know, sometimes people say, you know, each day can be attributed or thought of as long periods of time. But God is very clear that Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. So we have the day astronomically measured as the rotation of this planet one time on its axis. We call that a solar day. We have the month, and how do we measure the month? By the phases of the moon, right? And we have the year, one revolution of this planet plus the moon. In, in cosmology, they call that a binary. This planet and the moon, as the moon is, is uh, going around the Earth, the Earth-moon system, the binary is going around the sun every 365 days. You see how that works? And so God, because he loves us and he wants to communicate with us, has defined how long those days of creation were. He said, as an astronomical measurement, the evening and the morning, first day. Evening and morning, second day. So, in other words, he's uh, relating to us, he's getting across to us that these are literal 24-hour days, as you see up on the picture there in the left-hand side. So first of all, he's using the word day, which is the most common use of a word day in all of Scripture. It means a 24-hour period 98% of the time. So that's the word God used because he wants us to understand that he created in a day. But then he also gave us the astronomical measurement of a day, which is the evening and the morning, the rotation of this planet one time on its axis. But... He also gave us a blueprint or a pattern to follow. God is all-powerful, is he not? Amen. Yeah, he is all-powerful. He could have created in the snap of a fingers. In Texas, we call these fingers. In a snap of his fingers, he could have created everything, right? Yeah. But he took six literal 24-hour days, and he rested on the seventh. See how easy this is? He rested on the seventh. Why? We think it's probably because God is giving us a, a, a pattern or a blueprint to follow. God is telling us, look, I worked six days and rested on the seventh so that we might work six days and rest on the seventh. And so I think those are three good reasons to interpret Scripture as being just literal 24-hour days. Think of that individual who's stuck on a desert island reading the Bible. He's never read it before. I think I bring that analogy up here pretty soon. But what about the origin of the week? Well, there's no astronomical measurement for a week, is there? Because a week, ladies and gentlemen, is God-given. God gave us the week. There's no astronomical measurement or, if you will, verification. 
of a week. So all scripture is inspired by God. Do you believe that this morning? Absolutely. I believe that 100%. God is not the author of confusion. All scripture is inspired by God. But look at this. When it comes to Genesis, uh, excuse me, Exodus chapter 20, God really wanted to get it right for all of us. And so although we as God's people this morning believe that all scripture is inspired, God used his divine finger, as we say in Texas, finger, and he inscribed in solid rock the Ten Commandments. By his own finger, he inscribed the Ten Commandments because he wanted to make sure that we get it right. I think that's kind of neat. So this scripture, Genesis, excuse me, Exodus chapter 20 was inscribed by God. That's kind of neat. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. There it is, Exodus chapter 20. When I was in uh, graduate school in zoology, we had to buy textbooks, which were very expensive. They had color plates, hideously expensive. And I would use a a magic marker, a Sharpie, and I'd put on the edge of the, the book there, Exodus 2015. And people would ask me, hey, what does that mean? What are you doing putting Exodus 2015 on your expensive textbooks? And I'd never tell them. I'd say, look it up. And it would force them to look into the Bible. <laughs> and they'd look it up. Anybody know what Exodus 2015 says? Thou shalt not steal. <laughs> I, seriously, that's what I did in all my textbooks there. The time scale matters because the Bible teaches a young world, as we just read in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. Six days. The context, it's obvious. It's plain. It's painfully obvious. Ordinary days. A lot of people want to make the days long because they want it to agree with secular geology that talks about millions and millions of years. I'm not interested in trying to bring my Bible in line with people who hate uh, creation, hate Christianity, and embrace the secular lifestyle. Uh, If somebody's going to move, I would like to see them move to the authority of God's Word. Just as they now are coming to realize that this planet at one time was covered with water in the past. I think that's kind of neat. So, Exodus 31, 18, written with the finger of God. Exodus 31. So, if people want to start questioning a a six-day creation, then I think it's a slippery slope. I really do. Then pretty soon they're going to start questioning a virgin birth, turning water into wine, walking on water. And so, let's believe God from the very first verse. Let's believe God through the all 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. Let's believe God from the beginning. I like what Martin Luther said. How long did the work of creation take? When Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, then let us this period continue to have been six days days. And do not venture to devise any comment according to which six days were one day. Martin Luther goes on. But if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. (laughs) Amen. I read that and I did a backflip. I I thought that was was really kind of neat. Well, Let's for, say, for example, that a man who is on a sailing ship in the 17th century, three-masted schooner in the South Pacific, they run into a typhoon, the ship flounders and sinks, and there's only one survivor, and it's this guy. All hands are lost. He holds on to some debris. It washes him up on a desert island shore. And he builds himself a little lean-to after the, the wreck of the ship. And so he... Um, is going along after he built uh, built the lean-to, and he found the captain's sea chest that washed up on the shore. It was sealed. It was sealed. And he broke open the sealed chest from the captain's ship that sunk, and he found this, the captain's Bible. Now, this man was a castaway, and he was learned, he was educated, but he had never read the Bible. He didn't care about the Bible. But now he's stuck on a deserted island, 
and he started reading the Bible from Genesis to the maps. <laughs> over and over again, he read the Bible clearly. And that's all he did, all, all the time that he had reading and studying the Bible. Do you suppose as he read the Bible as a castaway, after he read again, once again, the last chapter of the book of Revelation, he would close the Bible and think, wow, this planet must be 4.6 billion years old. And shake your head like this. No, he wouldn't. He wouldn't uh, come to that conclusion because the Bible doesn't teach millions and millions of years. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach millions of years. As a matter of fact, as you continue to study God's Word, you will see that this earth is only, according to what Scripture says, just thousands of years old. And so nowhere in the Bible does it speak of millions of years. Um, I like this from uh, Luke chapter 1. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, and then look at this which have been since the world began. Isn't that interesting? God's prophets have, be, have been there since the world began. According to the pre-Zacharias, God has been speaking through his prophets ever since the world began, not beginning billions of years after it began. In his temple sermon, the apostle Peter preached that God had promised someday, look at this, to restore all things which... God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, when class, since the world began, Acts chapter 3. So, in two places in the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, Acts chapter 3, God is telling us that the worlds were created and God's prophets were created at virtually the same time. And if God, who is not the author of confusion, wanted us to understand that the earth is impossibly old, there are words and phrases in the original language that mean very long periods of time. And he would have included that in these two statements. But he didn't. He is telling us clearly in two different places that he created the worlds and God's prophets at virtually the same time. The secular scientist, unfortunately, has intimidated a lot of people. Maybe it might be because they wear a white lab coat and carry a clipboard. <laughs> okay, I'm being facetious. But the secular scientist says, look, the Bible is not true. The earth is millions of years old. I'm a scientist, believe me. <laughs> and unfortunately, the theologian says, wow, I have to add what he says to the Bible. He must know what he's talking about. And that's very sad, very sad that that sort of thing goes on over and over again. Well, we begin to study the, the world around us that God has created, and we find, for example, something called carbon-14 in diamonds. That's kind of unique. Carbon-14 is only, you can only uh, date things thousands of years with carbon-14. You're not using radiometric dating of uranium to thorium and, and lead and that sort of thing. And so according to carbon-14 content in diamonds, which is incredible, uh, the secular estimated age is 1 to 2 billion years from isop isotope dating, the minerals within the diamonds, yet the carbon-14 limits the age to just a few thousand years. So that's kind of interesting, geologically speaking, and there's other examples, of course, as well, that you can read about in the books that we have on the book table. In my field of biology, this is what I get excited about, because in my field of biology, they are now finding, as I would mentioned before, folks, soft dinosaur tissue. Soft dinosaur tissue, remember that collagen I was talking about? They're also finding nerves, triceratops, which is the animal with the three horns, the dinosaur. A friend of mine, Mark Armitage, has found osteocytes, which are bone cells in the horn of the triceratops that allegedly lived many, many millions of years ago. Mark is now finding the actual cellular content, the osteocyte bone cell, of the triceratops. Here, paleontologists, those who study fossils, find chromatin. Now, chromatin is tightly packed DNA molecules that have proteins called histones. And the DNA wraps around these histone proteins in a very tight manner. This means the 125 million year old dinosaur, this is coming from an evolutionary quote, 
cell has a nucleus so well preserved that it retains some original biomolecules and threads of chromatin that I just described. Quote, the results thus provide preliminary data suggesting that remnants of original dinosaur DNA may still be preserved. So they're hesitant, and I understand that. And so I will go along with their hesitancy in saying, look, this is strictly dinosaur DNA. The, the evidence is very, very compelling. And if we're finding soft dinosaur tissue, it's not too much of a step to say, look, if we're finding the tissue, we just might find the DNA as well. And the indication, and we have to be careful, the indication is they're finding the DNA. And these are some of the pictures that they take. This is called histology, the study of tissues. Uh, one of my favorite classes in graduate school. But this is exciting stuff. So both from the uh, physical science of geology and the life science of biology, we're beginning to see compelling evidence, not proof, but compelling evidence for a young Earth. And fossils are not millions of years old. As a matter of fact, some of you are taking notes. Please write this down. Floods form, fossils fast. <laughs> Floods form fossils fast. We have t-shirts like that at the Discovery Center at ICR. Floods form fossils fast. We find fossils of fish in the middle of eating another fish when they're suddenly and catastrophically buried like you would get with a, um, um, like you'd get with a Oh, somebody said a flood. Yeah, yeah, that's right. A flood could do something like that. Suddenly and catastrophically buried like you would get with a really, really big flood. And they're so suddenly and catastrophically buried that they're well preserved. That predators and scavengers are not able, not able to get to them because they're buried so quickly. Bacteria that usually degrades tissue uh, cannot get in there to degrade it suddenly and catastrophically buried, we'll say like a flood. So the sedimentary rock layers, rock layers laid down by running water. The three most common sedimentary, rock layer, uh, sedimentary rocks excuse me, are sandstone, limestone, and shale. Those are the three most common, all of which are laid down by running water. And what we find in the fossil record are trillions and trillions of fossils fossils. And so what is the most common fossil? So for example, here in Washington State, you might walk around and, and find some sedimentary rock units. It's easy to find containing fossils. And the most common fossil are marine invertebrates. Well, that's kind of hoity-toity, fancy type of stuff. Marine invertebrates. Let's just say clams. And so the majority of the fossil record are clams. Clams at the bottom of the fossil record, clams in the middle of the fossil record, clams at the top of the fossil record, and clams from side to side. Just clams, a lot of clams. A whole bunch of clams. Just, just clams. Clams, okay? As a matter of fact, if you were to take the person sitting next to you, blindfold them, and take them out to the fossil record and have them choose 100 fossils, they're blindfolded, completely at random. Statistically, what would 95 of those 100 fossils be? I'll give you a hint. <laughs> Clams. They'd be clams. And then all the rest of the fossils in that remaining 5% would be things like plants, fossilized plants, fossilized reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, and, of course, those missionary lizards that we call dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. So a very small percentage of the fossil record is really made up of dinosaurs, and yet people think dinosaurs when you say fossil. And so... Um, this is the fossil history record according to evolution, the millions of years of slow and gradual evolutionary processes spanning a half billion, with a B, a half billion years. But we as creationists have the Word of God written by someone who was there in the beginning, and the Bible tells us that God sent a flood only about 4,500 years ago because the world was filled with violence. Do you remember reading that phrase in Genesis? The world is filled with violence. And as a matter of fact, I believe it's in Genesis chapter 7, that phrase, filled with violence, is used twice in one verse. 
the world was filled with violence. And so that's why God sent a flood. And we have uh, a residual evidence of the flood even today in the 21st century. As ICR, the last couple of decades, would have tours of Grand Canyon because the evolutionists said in the early 1980s, if you're a creationist, uh, j just go to Grand Canyon and that will cure you of your creationist conviction. Well, we picked up the gauntlet. In other words, we said, okay, we'll start doing that. And when I joined ICR in 1996, I was assigned to take backpacking groups down the Bright Angel Trail in a series of switchbacks one mile down uh, from the south rim of the Grand Canyon to the Colorado River shore and have lectures regarding these sedimentary rock units that are laid down there, just like pancake stacking. Boy, oh boy, I'm here to tell you folks, if you want evidence for the Genesis Flood, go to Grand Canyon. You will be ready to stake out Grand Canyon <laughs> with Bible verses because it is so clear uh, this uh, Grand Canyon in northern Arizona was formed by a lot of water over a short period of time. Evolutionists say just exactly the opposite. They say Grand Canyon is formed by just a little bit of water over vast periods of time. In other words, they say the Colorado River carved out Grand Canyon sand grain by sand grain over 66 million years. No, I think the evidence points very clearly to the end of the end portion of the Genesis flood. So as we review, we're getting close to uh, being uh, uh, through here. We believe in a six literal 24 hour day creation, but due to man's actions, uh, there in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, sin entered the world and caused a flood then about 4,500 years ago because the earth was filled with violence. So when we would take people to Grand Canyon on the south rim there, before we would go down, guess what we did? We had communion. We had communion because as you stand and look out at this great expanse of Grand Canyon, we realize as majestic, and yes, it is quite beautiful, especially at sunset, we understand we're seeing the evidence of God's judgment upon a very wicked world. And so we have communion, and uh, that's, that's how we start. I think it's a good way to start to acknowledge the, why Grand Canyon formed in the first place. So evolutionists say through millions of years of death and disease and parasitism and bloodshed, man's existence came into being. But that's not what the Bible teaches. So the Bible teaches our first parents sinned thousands of years ago, which resulted in physical death. So what we like to say is if you're born once, if you, if you're, um, was it, if you, um, how does that phrase go again? If you're born uh, once, you die twice. Yeah, if you're born once, that is a physical birth, you die twice. You die physically, but also, sadly, you die spiritually as well. But if you're born twice, physical born, and then born again, as it says in John chapter 3, then you only die once, physical death. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. So we have the very good creation, but we have this intrusion of death and disease and pain due to sin of our first parents. Evolutionists love to criticize and condemn the creationists because of all the terrible things that we see in the world today. But they simply don't understand or they do not acknowledge Christian theology, which has a reason for this death and disease and suffering. Praise God, however, there will be a re restoration someday, won't there? And that's something that we look forward to, a new heaven and a new earth. So instead of being angry at God when we have the passage of a loved one, we should understand that the whole creation groans and travails and pain together until now, as Paul talks about in that critical, critical chapter in the New Testament called Romans chapter 8. And so, yes, we do have the intrusion of death and disease and pain, but praise God, we have a restoration. God will wa wipe away all tears. Won't that be a wonderful day? 
So, folks, I do have some uh, books out on the, uh, the table back there, and uh, Barry, my good friend, will, will take your money, but this is Creation Basics and Beyond here. This is a book that gets into lots of wonderful detail regarding creation science from a pr biblical perspective. It's a thick book. A number of us have written and con uh, condensed articles and contributed articles to this book, and so that's called Creation Basics and Beyond. This is what you want to give to uh, an individual individual who might be a science major at a, a university or a college. This is a book to give them, Creation Basics and Beyond. Uh, I wrote a book called The Guide to Animals. This is something that you might, might want to read to your kids and your grandkids. This makes a really good Christmas present. And as the old saying goes, Christmas is coming. Uh, I also wrote this book on the oceans, The Guide to Oceans here. And we have the shoreline right here in the great state of Washington. And so this has been revised, updated, and expanded. So it's now the new ocean book. Um, and so that is a wonderful book to read to the kids. Dr. John Morris and I, John is now with the Lord. We wrote The Fossil Record, and never have I enjoyed writing a book so much as this book. It's a coffee table book. It has some beautiful plates of uh, the various kinds of fossils and all. I wrote about the last one-third of the book where I address the so-called missing links. Do you know what we say at ICR? The missing links are missing. <laughs> It's a very profound thing to say this morning. The missing links are missing. We also like to say floods form fossils fast. Floods form fossils fast. And so this is great. Now, when I was in Gunnison, Colorado, back a long, long time ago, I worked at a radio station, KGUC Radio, 38.4 in your radio dial. Uh, high today, uh, 84 degrees. And so anyway, I, uh, I worked there at, IC, at, at the uh, radio station, and we had these turntables. You remember those turntables? And then you'd put these plastic platters on the turntable. What do you call those plastic platters? Records, yeah, records. And so people call me up at the radio station and say, Frank, would you play the fossil record? <laughs> that, that was a time release joke. <laughs> but I would tell them, no, we don't play rock music. <laughs> no. Okay, so please avail yourself to these books here. And um, Pastor, I think I can turn it over to you. I'm not sure who to turn it over to. And... Um, all right.